Well, Friday, this is Sunday, so Friday I flew to Denver, and Saturday I flew back. Went over there for the uh, the Colorado Insta, Insta, and I'm trying to again, Independence Institute. Uh, they were having their annual ATF party, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. They celebrate all of those, do some shooting, and then when the guns are all put away, then they do some cigar smoking and uh, have some adult beverages, and I uh, gave a little talk there. It was a great time. I got to shoot a little sporting clays. Uh, no, I didn't keep score. I was kind of a floater. I didn't shoot in any squad, which was kind of fun, actually, because I would walk around at the various stations, and after the squad was finished, I would say, hey, anybody got a 12-gauge? Because I, I had some 12-gauge shells with me. I said, anybody got a 12-gauge I could borrow? And so I would just borrow somebody's gun. And so I had semi-autos, I had pumps, and I had over-and-unders. Uh, there was a side-by-side that one fellow was using, but I believe it was 20-gauge. And I clearly did not use that. But it was great fun. This was with the, uh, I have to look, look it up, Kiowa Creek, I think it is. Shooting range east of Denver. Really nice sporting clays facility. And the Independence Institute and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. It's uh, a state organization. Evidently, there are, I did not know this, are a number of state libertarian-based think tanks around the country. And that's what this is. It was very interesting. Um, libertarian to me, just my take, and I may have this wrong, okay, is basically the, the leave us the hell alone line of thinking when it comes to government. And I have no problem with that. But uh, I was out in Denver area the last couple of days. I was speaking at the Independence Institute's Alcohol, Tobacco, and Fire. It's their ATF party where they're shooting and then smoking and after the guns are put away, some adult beverages. Uh, I was invited out there by Dave Copel. He's the research director of the Independence Institute. He's uh, an associate policy analyst with Cato Institute, adjunct professor of advanced constitutional law at the University of Denver's Sturm College of Law. Uh, but you may know him through a lot of his uh, work on the gun rights side with a lot of court cases, but also a great book, The Samurai, the Mountie, and the Cowboy, Should America Adopt Gun Controls of Other Democracies. Dave's with us right now. Hey, Dave, thank you for uh, inviting me out there. I had a ball. Well, we were really happy to have you, and you, you gave a, a, a great speech and uh, really uh, energized a, a lot of folks. Well, cool. It was, uh, it was also fun wandering around uh, when everybody was shooting, and I got to uh, kind of mooch along with some of the squads. It was great. And by the way, what is the name of that range where you are? Uh, Kiowa Creek. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll get, get you the exact name, but Kiowa Creek is the base, and it's, okay. uh, it's not only got sporting clays, uh, but they will train your gun dogs, and they actually have um, on-property bird hunting uh, in the, uh, the fall. Nice. And that's a really Kiowa first Creek class Sporting place. Club. Kiowa, Kiowa Creek Sporting Club. W-A. Okay. K-I-O-W-A, just like the Indians. Okay, sounds good. All right, so uh, got I'm thinking, we talked about so many different things when I was there. It's like we're just bouncing ideas off, and I love talking with you because you have all these ideas. But you sometimes look at things in a different way, and I guess it's because of that. I, I talk about you and some of the, your really smart civil rights law buddies. Uh, you think in terms of 3D chess rather than checkers. Uh, are there areas where we don't really understand or maybe we're not as good at produce, uh, arguing, if you will, or presenting our case as we should be? Um, on, on the presenting the case, I would say no. I mean, one of the things, obviously, you've been working on with, with Gun Talk ever you know, since 1995 has been explaining to activists how to be more effective as activists. And part of that, as, as you say, is that Particularly because it's the the gun issue, and you're not trying to convince the the, the haters uh, on the other side. You're, you're trying to convince moderate people who may not know that much mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. And your tone matters a lot. Uh, so a a moderate, calm, thoughtful tone, uh, really uh, like David Keene, um, the former president of the NRA, uh, is a, mm-hmm. is a really good role model for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that helped because it's guns. You know, you don't want people who are undecided to think, oh, well, these people who like guns, they're really scary and they're angry all the time. That That's not uh, the objective. Yeah. yeah it, it, and, it, it, and, you know, uh, getting up and down and yelling about your rights, which, you know, obviously I believe in. It's what my career is. Uh, I put more in work in that in my career than on any other issue. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but that's only convincing to people who already think you have the right uh, uh, and people who are undecided or, or mm-hmm. think that, you know, yeah, people have a right to have a gun, but they don't understand what's wrong with, you know, particular gun controls. Um, mm-hmm. They're not going to be convinced by, you know, you saying it, it, it's an absolute right. Um, so, as the Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Um, you know, not necessarily the wrath of the uh, the, the, the hate groups, uh, uh-huh. but they they help convince the uh, the people in the middle that the, we're the reasonable ones. Yeah, and I, may- I think we our, our movement's overall good at that, but there's always sort of stragglers who still insist on speaking in a way that is more about their emotional validation than it is about winning by convincing. Well, and, and you made a point when we were talking yesterday. Uh, you said. Uh, Look, if you're arguing about another issue, if you get really loud and opinionated and, you know, you're voicing your opinion really strongly, people aren't necessarily afraid of you. But if you're a gun person and you're making a lot of noise and really getting out there and in people's faces, they think, oh, he's a scary gun guy. So because of our issue, we are better off to present it in a softer, more mild-mannered, reasoned presentation. That that's right. You know, there and there's a difference in 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 everything in politics between the the, the speaking to to rally and, and and energize the people who already agree with you. You know, pe- preaching to the sure. choir, which is important because the you know you need to get the choir not just to show up on Sundays, but to uh, live out its mission twenty four seven, even when they're not in church. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that that's different, you know, but, you know, back to the evangelizing example, uh, that's not the way you would necessarily convince someone who, who's on the fence and thinking about, mm-hmm. you know, maybe they're thinking about religion for the first time, uh, but you don't get all like Billy Sunday and, and get up and rail against demon rum or, or whatever. Uh, the, the nicer and calmer you can be, the more important, uh, more effective you'll be. And, you know, the, the, the vast majority of the public, uh, logical arguments are are less persuasive to them than what they can pick up uh, on emotional cues. Well, it's one of the reasons I think that it's so effective. We have so many women now are being able to talk about this. You know, we talked about the faster program is now in Colorado. And I had a a lady come up to me uh, yesterday. She drove three hours from Kansas to be there. She'd been through the faster program, training teachers and school personnel to have guns in schools. And I asked her, I said, so, and she passed. She graduated from the course. I said, well, what did you think of it? And the first words out of her mouth were, it changed my life. It changed her. And now she becomes an advocate because now she, instead of saying it's my right, she's talking about protecting children and we care for kids and we care for each other. And the more we have women involved in shooting sports and getting their carry permits and even teachers and administrators you know, going through this kind of program, that's good for us. Oh, it, it, it absolutely, and uh, it, it, it's important to emphasize that you know with, with the programs like the, the Independence Institute helps support like Faster, which was something created by the Buckeye Farms Foundation in, in Ohio, and we've uh, copied it and brought it to Colorado and. Now, out of the 180 school districts in the state, uh, we've uh, trained people, teachers and administrators and other staff, in 30 of those school districts already, and we're, we're keeping it going. Um, but we, we are the pro-life side of this debate. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of obvious <laughs> to everybody that we're, we're the pro-choice side. Uh, but yeah. contrary to the, uh, the, the hate speech uh, from the, the Bloomberg Public Relations uh, team, we, we are the pro-life side. We're the ones who... Uh, put arms in the right hands so that uh, an innocent person can stay alive. That's a great way to put it. Dave, hold on a second. I've got to take a quick break. We'll come back. I want to talk a little bit about what we did there, also about the role of the Independence Institute and kind of how people can get involved in, in their particular states. Uh, my name is Tom Gresham. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN. We'll be right back. back when you were talking with Dave Copal from the Independence Institute out in Colorado. Dave, uh, explain what the Independence Institute is, if you would. We are the second oldest of the, the state-level think tanks in, in the United States. Uh, state-level think tanks started getting created in the uh, early Reagan years as states became more impoli- important policy centers and power started to flow and decision-making back back from Washington, D.C. to the states as, as our mm-hmm. constitution 
is meant to operate. And so we are the the second oldest. Uh, we've been around for over 25 years. We work on all kinds of issues: education, transportation, healthcare, taxes, uh, spending, and. Uh, I started working there full time in 1992, and I was the first person at, at any think tank in the United States uh, to be primarily involved in protecting the right to keep and bear arms. So uh, oh. we have long been uh, uh, the leader on uh, civil rights uh, research on the Second Amendment. Now, Independence Institute, uh, fair to say it is a primarily libertarian based or centered organization? <laughs> Yeah, um, although we, we have a big tent. I mean, there, there are people there, lots of people who call themselves libertarians. Some would say they're social conservatives. You know, we have people who, who voted for Obama uh, mm-hmm. in, on our staff as well. So we're, uh, we're intellectually um, open-minded. But the, what you've got to believe in to work at the Independence Institute is the principles we are based on, which, as our corporate charter says, uh, the eternal truths of the Declaration of Independence. And there are state think tanks like this all over the country now. Ab- absolutely. That's uh, been a, a really positive thing to see is how that, that's grown. Um, and, and nearly every state now has uh, some kind of think tank uh, that, that works on li- liberty issues. I think the, it's the, uh, the Pelican Institute in um, Louisiana does, does a lot of great work, but they're, they're all over. And whatever, wherever you are uh, locally, if you can uh, be a supporter of your local think tank. You know, some some of them do gun issues, uh, lots of them don't, but they'll all be doing uh, good work in, in the in vineyards of uh, liberty and human rights. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I met a lot of great people there. You know, the other thing is, and I just I want to touch on it, everybody I met who worked and works at the Liber- uh, Independent, Independence Institute, they all seemed very happy and glad to be doing what they do. That was really an interesting thing for me. Yeah, this is uh, the ethos of uh, freedom. You know, there, there are some organizations which, you know, have an ideal, and then working at that place isn't the same. Like, you know, Google uh, is all about the free flow of information and, you know, connecting people with and letting a, a thousand flowers bloom uh, for ideas, except if you actually work there, uh, you've, you've got about as much freedom of thought uh, and expression as if you work for the uh, Communist Party uh, <laughs> central headquarters in Beijing in uh, 1965. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in Independence Institute, we, we we do have a lot of fun, and that that's an important thing about it is, you know, it, it's a good place for flex time. It's it, it's very family friendly. We're dog friendly, and we hire people who we don't have to sit on top of and you know have an egg timer uh, from nine zero zero to five zero zero to make sure they get their work done. Uh, we, we hire responsible people who will will get the work done without having to be micromanaged, and so there's a lot of autonomy and, and a lot of fun. Uh, talk, we, if you would, talk, talk about this concept of the happy warrior, the Molly Ivan story. Well, so um, Molly Ivins, I, I saw her uh, give a speech in uh, the early 90s at a uh, American Civil Liberties Union ceremony where my dad, a, a state representative, was getting their Legislator of the Year award. And she talked uh, She talked about uh, being at the deathbed of a guy named Joe Rao, R-A-U-H. And Joe was one of the great uh, civil rights attorneys uh, of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and did so much to dismantle Jim Crow and, and other you know, mm-hmm. uh, unjust systems of oppression. And as, as Molly told the story, and, and Joe had just died, you know, not that long ago, and she was she was there. Uh, and what, what Joe Rouse said to her is, Molly, tell him how much fun it was. And she urged us to have that, that same kind of thing, is you don't have to be all grim and angry and upset all the time. You you can be happy. I mean, if, if you've got uh, a life where either you know it's your job or you've got enough time in your life to be a volunteer uh, and work on a, a on an important cause. Uh, that's something to be joyful about in itself, and and be a happy warrior, and you'll be a more effective uh, warrior for gun rights if if you can be happy about it. Because uh, you know, I mean, we, you, you can see this. It, it, well, it, make, it, it, it yeah. makes it easier to show up in the morning when you love what you're doing. Be a happy warrior. I love it. Dave, we are out of time here. I want to thank you again. Uh, what you guys are doing is fabulous. I was very impressed. Thank you.
Thank you. You do great work uh, on gun talk, and you've been uh, so helpful for our rights for a uh, quarter century now. Thanks, Dave. Listen, you take care. Tell everybody there hello for me. Great group, Independence Institute. Uh, if you get a chance, check it out. Maybe you can go to the ATF party next year.